Thank you, brother. Well, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. It truly is a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, I've been to Finland. This is my, this is the second time I've been to Finland. It is beautiful. It is green and it never gets dark. It about drives me nuts, but the Lord willing, he has blessed each journey and I trust that he will also bless this journey as well. Isaiah chapter 42 beginning at verse one, behold my servant in whom I uphold my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Thus says the Lord God, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord and I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. I have appointed you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. Let's go together to the Lord once again in prayer. Father, we do approach you, Lord, is trembling lip, Lord, knowing that you are God and that you are the God who will not give your glory to another, that you are the God who sits enthroned upon the encirclement of the earth, that you are the God who has to humble himself even to behold the heavens, let alone the earth. And yet, Father, we come here gathered together Lord, as Joel has already proclaimed, Lord, as your people, we come boldly, Lord, not because of any merit or deed in which we have done in righteousness, not because we have lived some pietous life. Oh God, can we approach you? But we come now, Lord, approaching you in the name of Christ Jesus, based solely upon his redemptive work for our soul. And Father, we praise him. We thank you so much that our elder brother, our savior, this servant is now seated at your right hand, making intercession for us so that we can come and lay our petitions at your feet. And our petition, Lord, this evening is one. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. God, I pray, Lord, you know that that is not vain repetition. God, we need it. We desire it. God, it's just not mere information we seek from your word, Lord, this day, but we seek, Father, communion with you. Father, we can't do anything to produce that communion. So Lord, we come and we ask, Father, visit us, not simply now in this hour, but God visit us, Lord, for the rest of these four days. Come, 
Walk among your lampstands. Walk among your people. Do something, oh God, this preacher cannot do. Touch the hearts of men. Change them. Conform them. Open their eyes so that they may behold the servant, your beloved. Oh God, help us now. We humbly pray, knowing that Christ reigns beside you, knowing that you delight to reveal yourself to your children. Help us now. We ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40 really quickly. I want you to look at a single verse because this verse here sets the stage of everything that we are going to experience over the next four days. Isaiah 40 verse 27. It says this. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. That really does set the table for this first servant song. Because what we have here is Israel complaining. They are complaining due to this lack of justice that they see. They speak as if the God who made the heavens and the earth is not even aware of their situation, does not even see their situation. They speak of this lack of justice. And what this lack of justice, what they are referring to here is the Babylonian captivity. How could you, O oh God, is there not justice in you? How could you let the Babylonians come and judge this nation, this nation that carries your very name? How can this be that these heathens, these idol worshipers, these pagans, could come and wipe your people off of this land. They speak as if God doesn't, is not even aware of what is happening here. They speak as if this is unjust. And as you go forward in chapter 41, you see God answers them. God answers them. And he says, yes, I understand your lack of understanding, but I'm going to tell you the Babylonians, though they will judge you, they themselves will also be judged. In fact, I'm going to raise up a man by the name of Cyrus, a Persian, and he will come and judge them. And then from there, God now addresses the nations, all the nations at once. And he says, look, I want you to understand something here. It's not because your strength of your gods that you will be able to wipe away Jerusalem. For your gods are absolutely and utterly nothing. It is not because of the strength of your gods. In fact, then God goes on to compare himself to these gods. And he says in verse 21, listen, calling them in, as it were, to the courtroom. In, in chapter 41, verse 21, present your case. Bring forth your strong arguments. If your gods are like me, here it is, then declare to me the future. If you have power, then tell me what's going to take place here after. Show yourself. Do anything is the challenge to these false gods. And the conclusion is at the very last verse before we enter the servant songs. Behold, all of them are false. Their works are worthless. Their molten images are wind and emptiness. There is no one like God. And that sets the stage 
as we come into chapter 42. And what we will see here is this atmospheric, this seismic shift that takes place at this point in time. With this understanding of Cyrus, who will be raised up years from the, this prophecy to come in and destroy the Babylonians with this challenge of the false gods, show me the future if you are real. Now God himself is going to speak and he is going to declare the future. And he is going to point to another one of his servants that will arise from this earth. And this servant, my friends, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, this servant is like no other servant that you will ever lay your eyes up on ever in the history of mankind. It is a seismic shift. What he is about to declare here is huge. And that is coming into the first of what we will see for servant songs. This servant song here is but a mere introduction, a mere thousand feet look, a mere introduction of what this servant, what he is going to be about. And then as we go forward to the second and to the third, and finally the fourth servant song, we will get detail after detail after detail until we come to the place where everything is laid clear. Everything is beautiful. But this thousand foot look right here at this introduction has that very theme at it. He will be the servant of justice. Justice. That's the introduction. He says it three separate times. I will bring forth justice to the nation or he will. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. In other words, Cyrus is saying this. I mean, God is saying this. You think Cyrus is something special? You think me declaring Cyrus is something special? Well, let me tell you something. I'm going to so show you something extremely special here. Let me show you my true servant. My true servant. And that's what he says. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. Now the design here, as we are leading up to this amphitheater from uh, chapter 40, all the way through chapter 40, the design here is speaking to Israel, Jerusalem. He's speaking to the nations. He's speaking to those heathens and those pagans. And the whole design here is to bring everyone together and pull them to put them at a single focus on one person, this man. This servant. It's as if he gathers all the eyes and declares to himself, Behold, look, stare at him. Look upon him. Look to him. And my friends, that is my desire for this conference. That is my desire for this conference. Not to look at him as a science project. Not to look at him as some kind of statistical, analytical data. Something that I can take away from and say, man, that was great. I'd never heard that before. That's not it. Look at him. Behold him in order to commune with him. Commune with him. That's the desire of this conference. That's the desire of my heart. I want you walking away from this place. Determined. To go into the prayer closet more. Determined to open up God's word. Determined with bowed knees. With tears in your eyes. Searching out the scriptures. So that you can behold this servant. Anything less we failed. Anything less we have failed or I have failed. 
So let's behold this one whom God himself says, behold, let us behold him. Look at what it says here. He is upheld one whom I uphold. Now this can be seen in actually two ways. Number one, he is girded, undergirded, backed by the very infinite power of God. He is upheld by God. The very weight of God himself, this man carries. You know, if I take an empty box, a large empty box, kind of like this pulpit right here, empty box, cardboard box, very light. I stick it out here in the field. A, 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 a very quick wind comes, it will pick up that box and carry it to the other side of the field. But if I take the exact same box and I put gravel or a stone or marble in it, fill it up all the way to the rim, it doesn't matter what wind blows, it ain't moving that box. And that's kind of the language that we see here. He is the servant whom I uphold. The ones who declares the future, the one who rolls out life as it were, like a carpet upon this earth. He is the one I uphold. That's one way you could see it. Or as Spurgeon and Calvin and Al Barnes points out, this words can be translated also this way, whom I lean upon. Now that's a very rich thought too. Whom I lean upon. It's as if the full purpose. It's as if humanity. God leans upon his purpose. Upon this one single individual. God has entrusted and laid upon this one individual. Upon his shoulders of accomplishing his will. For his glory. Giving him all power and all authority. He is like no other. He is upheld. And he is also what we read here, the chosen one. You know, when Samuel was presenting Saul to the people, you guys remember the story. Samuel's presenting Saul to the people. He says, now, therefore, here's a king that you have chosen, whom you have asked for. That's the way Samuel presents Saul. When that people, when those group, when that nation looked for a king, they looked for a man tall in stature. They looked for a man like a king like the other seen in the other nations. And this was a king that they desired. This was a king after their own heart. Well, this servant here is not the people's choice. We must understand that. God is not calling for a vote. God is not calling for an election. God is not asking man's opinion. This is his servant. This is his elect. This is the chief cornerstone, the precious cornerstone that he himself upholds and lays for the foundation, regardless of man's desire, regardless of what man's opinion is. This is God's choice. And not only that, he is the one in whom the Lord's soul delights. What man can understand the depth of a statement such as this? The one whom the Lord's soul delights. Now, yes, we know that this is written in anthropomorphic language, but it gives us something here that the Lord has communicated that we are able to grasp. And what we are able to grasp is this, the whole soul of God, if there was such a thing, the whole soul of God, his very essence, his very whole being delights in the whole being of this servant. He has the deepest satisfaction. We could put it this way. He is the apple of his eye. Now look, it is possible for God to use a person that he does not delight in. God can use a man like Cyrus, who is a wicked Persian, who does not get converted. He can use a man like that to accomplish his will, but not this servant. This servant is one in whom the very soul of God delights in. As one commentator said this, 
He is not only the right servant for the job, but he is the right servant for the Lord himself. He is the right servant for the Lord himself. It's not just he delights in giving this servant a particular task. No, that's not it at all. He delights in the task, no doubt. But he delights in this servant. It is his heart. Righteous, thoroughly, complete. This one whom loves the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. This one who delights in walking in the fear of the Lord. Perfect in character. Reflecting God perfectly. How could God, how could God how could God's soul delight in anything less? Not only that, we read, I have put my spirit upon him. Now, in light of the Old Testament, we see that the spirit of God usually comes upon people for a specific task or a specific role. You know, a specific task is what we would see in the book of Judges. The nation goes into oppression. God raises up a man. He puts his spirit upon that man. That man gets the strength like an army of 10,000 and is able to deliver. Or a specific role. God puts his spirit upon a Moses, a deliverer who delivers his people from bondage, who has this wisdom, is able to judge the nation. Or he puts his role on a specific or the spirit on a specific role as in regards to a prophet. A prophet where he is filled with the very spirit of God and he is able to speak revelatory revelation, direct revelation from God. That's the role of a prophet. But here, I think this is referring to that which we see in an earlier prophecy in the book of Isaiah. Go ahead and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11, a very famous prophecy. <clears throat> And I'll read it really quick. Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord, listen to this. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see. He will not make a decision by what his ears hear, but with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. That's the point. We see someone here with the spirit of God resting upon him. He's not like one of those judges. He's not even like one of those prophets. He's not even like one of those anointed kings. Here we see the spirit resting upon him. No departure. Not for a period of time. Not while in office. But we are talking about the state of this man's life. We are talking about a man who speaks with bold revelation. Who walks around with the wisdom of the word of God. Always fearing the word, the Lord, always fearing the Lord. This is the elect servant and whom God upholds. Now, what is his mission? What is his mission? He will bring forth justice to the nations. He is the executor of justice. Now, when we talk about nations, we are talking about Gentile nations. We are talking about the nations of the world here. He will execute justice on the nations. Now, this word justice in our language, we typically think forth of the judgment of punishment. You know, someone commits a crime. We say Justice needs to be done and justice is completed when actually the judge drops the gavel and says you're guilty or you're innocent and he sentences him. And then we typically say justice is finished. It's completed. 
But in the book of Isaiah, justice is used a little bit more comprehensive than that. Okay, it's not just the execution of justice, so to speak, but also what we will read is it's always tightly bound to this word called righteousness. It's not just correction of the wrong, but in the book of Isaiah, what we see is it's also establishing everything the way it should be under the order of God. It's all things being made right, ordering the creation under the rule and authority of God. Yes, it talks about the judgment of the wicked, but it goes much more than that. Thanks, brother. <clears throat> it's not that justice here will be executed by on a single nation or a single town. We're not talking about justice being executed on Jerusalem here. Or the city of the Babylons or the nation of Assyria. That's not what he's talking about here. We are talking about this one who comes, this servant. He will bring forth and execute justice to the nations, the nations, the nations. Now, here's the key. What would you expect a person like this to look like? What would you expect? If I said there was a man coming and he is going to be the executor of justice upon the pagan heathen nations, what would you think he would look like? You think he would have some miraculous display of power. He would come out and be really aggressive. Or if we look in the old Testament, he would come in and lay siege after city, after city, he would issue threats and warnings. And when he breaks down the city gate, he puts a hook in their noses and drags them away. Is that what we see here? Or we could even think of Cyrus since he is in the foreground here. You know how Cyrus executes justice? Well, we can read it in verse 25 of 41. He will come upon the rulers as upon mortar, even as the pots or even as the potter treads clay. That's the way Cyrus is pictured as bringing justice to Babylon. It's like pots, sherds on the ground and Cyrus just crushes them, crushes the people. As if they are just mere pottery under his feet. Is that the way this servant is going to come? Trampling down the people. That would be expected. But not this servant. Not this servant. He will not cry out or raise his voice. Nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. This is shocking. Remember, don't forget, this is one who is upheld by the omnipotent, infinite power of God. This God who is holy, holy, holy will not let one sin escape from this earth. And yet, how does this servant display his grand power in front of the nations? He flexes his muscle with selfless humility. Selfless humility. What ruler in the world Please tell me, think through the annals of history right now. We have seen rulers rise and we have seen rulers fall. We have seen nations rise and nations fall. Show me one that is like this one. One who rules by selfless humility. He does not cry out or raise his voice. 
He does not draw attention to himself. Isn't that beautiful? He's not self-advertising. You know, before there was TV and internet, men used to stand at the gate of the streets. They used to stand at the gate of the city and they would cry out to bring attention to themselves. They would cry out to try and gather a following, but not this one. In Jesus' days, the Pharisees went out in the streets and they made long cries with prayers in order to gain an attention of the people. The pastors today just do it on Facebook, Twitter, and social media. But not this one. Not this one. He will not cry out. He will not raise his voice. He's unassuming. He will not bring attention to himself. This servant does not seek his own. He's not trying to gain a following. He's not a man pleaser as it were. He is not trying to attempt to make himself popular. At not at all. He is a man who actually flees the spotlight. Imagine that. Man, that could be a lesson for today, my friends, should it not? This is a man who does not trumpet his own works or make them known. He is literally humble, humble. And not only that, not only is he humble, he is gentle. He will not trample the people like Cyrus. In fact, a bruised reed he will not break. A bruised reed, that little piece of straw that's not disconnected, but it has no more strength. It's like someone came by and snapped it, but yet didn't break it all the way. It's someone who is insignificant in the eyes of the society. It's someone whom people pass on a day-to-day -day basis and they literally pay no attention to. And when they do see this type of person, what do they do? They ignore them. They act like they don't see them. They get away from them. They go to the other side of the street in order to not gain their attention, in order to make sure they don't speak to that person or that person doesn't see their eyes and ask them a question. That's what we're talking about here. A bruised reed or dimly burning wick we read here. It's someone who is on the edge of non-existence. You've seen a wick right before it extinguishes. It's got that little itty bitty coal flame right on the tip. It is about to be extinguished. It is about to die. And yet this servant does not let it be extinguished. He revives it. Did you hear me? He revives it. Now remember... We are talking about the very enemy of God here. We are talking about the nations, the idol worshipers here. And even in that realm of idol worshipers, it, the narrow even focuses, and he's talking about the broken, even the depressed, even those whom the idol worshipers are not even caring for. It's like a second level, even deeper than the enemies of God. What a contrast to Cyrus. Tramples the people with his feet and this servant who stoops down to make sure that their life is not extinguished. I wish I could paint a picture of this, but words kind of escape me on this. Because it's almost like the most powerful king in all the world. And his nation completely rebels against him and his army. And every time he sends a servant to them, they kill him. They string him up. They torture them. They send the head back to the king. And he finally has enough. And he finally desires to bring justice to that nation. And you can see him mounted upon his steed. And the whole army, this mass of mighty warriors behind him and he rides to the edge of this land and he just happens to look down and notice and see a twig a blade of grass that's bent over 
And he gets off that steed and he strips himself of that army. And he bends down and he puts a splint on that one single blade of grass. That blade of grass that was destined to be trampled on by this army that's coming. And he takes off everything and he spends time to get that blade of grass back and nurse it to health. So it won't be bent over anymore. That's kind of the picture of what we are seeing here. It's not a picture of destruction to the nations. What we are seeing here is that of salvation. This is not death to the nations. What we are seeing here is life administered. But make no doubt about it. You better not make any doubt about it. He will faithfully bring forth justice is the next line. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Justice. Whereas the first justice statement talked about the universal nature of justice. He will bring justice to all the nations. This talks about how he actually executes justice here. In other translations, we read, he will bring forth judgment in truth or unto truth. He will do everything accordingly to the perfect standard of truth. There will be no error. There will be no mistake. There will be no misinformation, as it were. There will be no partial knowledge. He will bring about justice faithfully. Perfect knowledge. Perfect execution. Execution of justice unto truth. The world's never seen anything like this. Because even in today's society, I don't care what nation you go to in this world. I do not care. You will not see this. Because even an earthly judge, they're sworn to uphold the law of the land. No doubt about it. But they have imperfect knowledge. They have an inherently sinful heart. And they depend upon imperfect witnesses. And they also depend upon imperfect, corrupt, corrupt lawyers who only give information trying to win their case, withholding information that would damage their case. And they bring that before an imperfect judge who has to weigh the arguments, who does not have perfect knowledge, who is only getting a piece of partial information dependent on impartial and partial witnesses. And then he has to execute judgment. And then when he goes home at night, he thinks to himself, was that the right decision? Did I do what is right there? He always second guesses himself in that regard. Not this servant, my friends, not this servant. He has all the information. There is no jury. There is no lawyers. He sees all things. There is no second guessing there. He takes no bribes. He makes no mistakes. Perfect, eternal justice. And look at verse four. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Not only is he the executor of justice in truth, but he is also the establisher of justice. God's design for this world. He will not be disheartened or crushed. Crushed. There's actually a play of words here. In the original language, this word crushed is the exact word that we read above it called bruised. And what he is talking about here is though he is humble and gentle, though he is caring for the bruised, make no doubt about it. He is not weeble or weak and he is not feeble. He himself is upheld by God and he has this unbreakable mission. He will not stop. He will not fail. He will not break. He will not give up. He will execute justice. He will not be disheartened. Understand this. He does not come to make this possible. He co- this is not coming To present us with an option. No, that is not it. 
This is not a proposal that man should vote upon. This is not a truth that someone outside of this room or maybe even someone inside this room can either accept or dismiss. It does not matter what I think and it does not matter what you think. He will come and he will establish justice. He will establish it. Righteousness upon this earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Now in the book of Isaiah, when we talk about coastlands and islands and islands and coastlands, what it's talking about is the uttermost parts of this earth. It's the nations that are yet to be discovered. It's the nations of the tribal languages on the many islands out there all throughout, many of which they are even unaware of when they make stuff with statements like that. But look at what it says here. The coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. A couple things to notice here. Number one, it's one law that governs all. There's not a law for this coastland or this island and that island and this island. No, no, no. They will wait expectantly for his law. His law. Hmm. That means there is one king. One king. So we get a little bit of a hint of the divine nature of this servant here. One king over all of civilization. But that's the shock of it, isn't it? These are Gentiles we're talking about. They will wait expectantly for his law. So this servant comes to them in gentle humbleness. And the only way that we can describe this, he must do something in them. He must do something in them because now at the end of this, after the execution of justice, we have the coastlands. The islands, the Gentile nations, those near and those far waiting expectantly for his law. He changes them. He actually brings them into his fold. Once enemies, once enemies, now longing for his law. Amazing. And once again, I believe this is a reiteration of a previous prophecy that we see in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter two, listen to these words. Now it will come about that in the last days, a mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised up above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between nations and render decisions for many people. Now, what does that judgment look like? Execution, death, listen to the results. And they will hammer their swords and their plowshares into spears and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again. They will learn of war. Never again. They will learn of war. Never again. Beautiful. The Lord establishing justice upon the earth is like this mountain raised up. The nations streaming to it and his law established and peace reigning. Never to learn of war again. What an incredible work. We see at this thousand foot glance at the servant's work. Now this is obvious. And I hope you understand that this is obvious. When I speak of this servant, I am speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the gospel picture here. He is the one. Christ Jesus himself is the one whom the Lord opposed. His chosen one. The one in whom his soul delights. We see that at his baptism. This is the son. In whom I am well pleased. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, under the inspired, in the inspired word of God in the book of Matthew, chapter 12, we read of this story of Christ healing all who come to him. 
and he starts instructing the crowds and he says, do not tell any man who I am. And Matthew in verse 17 of chapter 12 quotes this passage. You see, when Matthew saw this, and he saw Christ healing the people and he saw himself making sure that he was not known among the crowds. He said, this is the fulfillment of he will not cry out in the street. He is not self-advertising. He's not trying to earn a reputation among men. He is the gentle shepherd, a humble servant who cared for the bruised, the broken, the forgotten, the crushed, the burned. And he is also the one who will execute justice on this earth. Now we have a lot of tension here. There is a high strung amount of tension in what we have read thus far. This tension will get solved later on as we begin to move through these servant songs. What's the tension you may ask? Well, justice demands judgment. So how could this servant grant life to a people and nations who deserve judgment? How could he show mercy to a people who deserve wrath? And how could he establish the truth without there being any death? Because sin in the economy of God brings judgment and death. And without the removal of sin, there can be no peace with God. Sin demands judgment. So how do these two concepts of him bringing justice to this earth, him being the establisher of justice, him being the executor of justice, him being the establisher and executor of universal justice to the entire planet and yet be the one who brings life to the people who deserve judgment. How can these things be? Well, that's what we're gonna look at. That's the journey that we are going to take through these servant songs. And it will take us through his life. It will take us through the cross. It will take us through his exaltation. Even here at the beginning is just a simple introduction. But that's, like I said, that is what I desire. I desire that we behold this servant. Because when we do, we will see what humanity is called to look like. We will see what man is designed for. You know, many think that mighty men are, uh, well, let me just put it this way. When you think of a mighty man, how do you typically define that? Because most, even in the Christian community, when they think of a mighty man, when they think of a man who is really just strong and mighty, you know, how do they define that? Do you define that as a weak man, a dependent man? Do you define that as a gentle man? man? Do you find that as a man who gives life? Do you define that as a man who speaks to the immigrant who's broken on the street? Because that's what we see here in the scriptures of this servant, the mightiest of all men. And I have to ask, how do you look at the bruised reed? How do you look at the bruised reed? How do you look at the dimly burning wick? How do you look at the depressed, the broken? Because I'll be honest with you, there are many times that I hate the way my heart looks at them. I hate sometimes how uncomfortable it makes me. And I hate sometimes me choosing to not engage with someone just simply to remain comfortable. I hate that. Because we are not men. We are not men who are called to that. He has the spirit resting upon him. We in this room have the spirit 
dwelling within us. And this is what we should follow, imitate, no doubt. But this passage also exposes a plague that I see in this world all around. And that is the temptation to make a name for yourself. Every man desires a reputation. Every man wants to see his name in lights. Every man almost, it seems like in today's world, especially in the States, wants to be some type of conference speaker. And it's a shame. I hate it. But what about you? When you do something that no man sees, do you have to tell others about it so you can get some type of recognition? When something comes to your mind that you might think, well, this will be impressive if I tweet about this. What do we do? Do we emulate what we see here? Because I'm going to tell you something. Reputation is a very, very dangerous thing. And I would beg everyone in this room, putting myself in that, this word, flee the spotlight. Because I am around men who are in the spotlight. And I'm going to tell you there is more pain and more temptation and more danger and more heartache and more things in that spotlight than you will ever, ever imagine. So beware of it. Run from it. Shut your mouth. Serve Christ. Live a life. Die and go home to be with God in glory. He's the only voice that matters anyway. He's the only voice that matters anyway. But I tell you, when we behold the servant and his selflessness, it makes me want to serve him even more, even more. Ain't that the challenge of it? Isn't that the challenge of it? The more we look to Christ, the more we should follow him. So let's do that. Let's do that this, this conference. Let's encourage one another to follow Christ more. Look, I know it's awesome to go out in the fellowship hall and speak of things of the weather and rain and thunderstorms and, and nature and sports and, and whatever you like to speak about. I have no idea what you like to speak, potatoes or whatever it is in Finland that you speak about. I don't know. Or we could talk about Christ, how we could follow him. Or we could confess our sin to one another. Or we could encourage one another. Brother, let's, let's do something for the immigrant. Let's do something for the downcast. Let's do something for the broken. Not that we can post on our church website to say this is our ministry. No, let's do something that no one knows about. That but we know that the Savior himself delights about. Let's do something like that. That's the challenge of this. So let's establish our hands in the Savior. Humbly serve. Gently care for the souls of people around you. Break down these barriers of not getting into one another's personal lives. And help one another. Listen, we're all broken people. I'm as broken as the best of them. And I need you to help me. And you need the little that I have to help you. So let's be like the Savior, drawing no attention to ourselves. Let's use our tongue not to tear down men, not to correct men's theology or whatever the case may be, but let's use our tongue to give life and minister life to others who are downcast. That's what the Savior did. That's what we are called to do. And that is what the father's soul delights in. May the Lord help each and every one of us do that. Pray for me as we go through these servant songs. They are heavy, they are taxing, but they are wonderfully beautiful and glorious. Let's pray. Father, we close this first session Father, in praise unto you, thanking you, Father, for salvation, 
for this servant, for this light, for the truth, for our God. Oh, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the example and the pattern that he set. Father, I pray that as we look, even now going forward, as we just have looked, God, that we would be a people who do not quickly forget. Oh, God, please do not allow us to be like the people of old. They would hear, they would grasp, they maybe even rejoice, but then they forget, forget. So Father, I pray that it would be more than just writing words upon a tablet or upon a piece of paper. God, I pray that you would write your word upon the corridors of our heart. Change us, oh God, change us. We ask and pray in Christ's name, amen.